Welcome to the Life United Podcast. We are all about helping you know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. We know that today's message is going to be a blessing to you. Welcome again to everybody who is watching us live, or if you're watching the recording, I'm so glad you decided to tune in. Listen, I I just want to ask, make a request before we get started. I want you to engage with me as if you're in the room with me. I'm going to do my best tonight to engage with you as if you're right here in the room with, with me. So I want you to engage with me as if I'm right there in the room with you. So if you would say it out loud, if you were in the room, I want you to type it in the chat. Uh, If it's something that you have a question or whatever it is, type it in the chat. I I won't be able to hear it if you say it out loud, but I can read it if you type it in the chat. So before we get started again, let's pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you for this opportunity for us to come before your presence. Lord, you are omnipresent. So just like you're here in this room with me, I'm trusting and believing that you're there in the rooms with everybody that is watching. I pray that your manifest presence will reveal itself to us in a fresh and a new way. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, and a willingness to obey. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so how many of you are like me? Over the last year, year and a half or so, you feel like you have just had to make decision after decision after decision. Like decisions we've never even had to think about before, we have to make now. And as soon as you make one decision, there's something new that you have to make a decision about. And then as soon as you make that decision, you have to change the decision you made from the first decision because the circumstances have changed. And so something as simple as whether or not to send your children back to school is a decision we've never had to make before. But those are the types of decisions that we're having to make today. And right when you get comfortable and thinking that you, okay, I'm going to send my child to school this fall then something changes and we have to rethink the decision that we just made. Yeah, we're all in that season right now. And so because of that, tonight I want to have a conversation with you just for a little while about decisions, decisions, decisions. And I'm going to come from Mark chapter 15, verses 6 through 15. So I know you're engaging with me, so you have your Bible right there. If you don't, run and get it real quick, because we're going to be walking through these verses, verse by verse. Mark chapter 15, verses 6 through 15. And if you would allow me, let me just give you a little context, and that will also give you a little more time to run and get your Bible. (laughs) Because up until this point, what's happened so far is Judas has already made the decision uh, to make a deal with the devil, so to speak. He's already decided to betray Jesus. Uh, Jesus has already had the Last Supper with his 12 disciples. He's already prayed his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, Let's see, what else has happened? He has already uh, had the kiss of death given to him by Judas. The, um, the, The... Soldiers have already come and taken him captive and taken him away uh, to Caiaphas' house where the Sanhedrin has already gathered around and played both judge and jury and rendered him guilty. And they have already taken him uh, as prisoner uh, to Pontius Pilate, the governor, to be further judged. And that's where the storyline picks up right here in Mark chapter 15 and verse 6. So let's start there. It says... Every year at Passover, it was the custom of the governor to pardon a prisoner and release him to the people, anyone they wanted. Now, Pilate was holding in custody a notorious criminal named Barabbas, one of the assassins who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowds gathered in front of Pilate's judgment bench and asked him to release a prisoner to them as was his custom. Okay, let's pause right there for a minute because there's so much in just those three short verses. All right, the first thing is, I, I want to ask you this. What do you do when your customs and traditions backfire on you? <laughs> what do you do when your customs and traditions backfire on you? Okay, so here it is. Pilate, the governor, he had these customs in place. I'm sure, I'm sure when he first uh, implemented this custom, it, it was with good intention. It had good reasoning. It had value attached to it. But over time, 
And it, particularly in this situation, I believe he's about to see this custom backfire on him. So we have to be careful about we, what we allow to remain as customs in our lives. And we have to be careful not to equate our Christianity to our customs. Okay, are you getting that? Don't equate our Christianity to our customs because there are some things that we have become accustomed to doing that if we find our identity in Christ in the custom and we aren't able to no longer continue in that custom, then what do we have left? Okay, so we can't equate our Christianity to our custom. And when we do that, when we do that, we hinder God from doing a new thing when we continue to hold on to the old things too tightly. All right, and sometimes that's what customs can do. Customs can be great when they were initially implemented, but if you're not monitoring them and adjusting them accordingly as the seasons change, you'll be doing an old thing in a new season, and it just does not work the same. So when we do that, our customs become false idols. We don't see it that way, but sometimes we're worshiping the custom instead of the creator. So we don't want to allow our customs to become false idols. Okay, notice the crowd did not come to Pilate. Did you notice that in the verse? I thought that was very interesting. The crowd didn't come to Pilate. I'm sorry, the Pilate didn't go to the crowd. The crowd came to Pilate. That's just something I thought was very interesting. Why is that interesting to me? Because I thought it was interesting that the crowd took notice of Pilate's customs. If you think the devil isn't watching you, you're deceived. (laughs) The devil is always watching. The enemy is always watching. He's watching what you do, how you do it, what your traditions and customs are, what you do habitually. Why? Because he's going to ever so slightly sneak into those areas that you aren't monitoring closely. And that's what happened here. The crowd came to Pilate. Okay, so, okay, here's, a, here's an example we can all appreciate. Why do you think it is that whenever you turn on your computer, <laughs> all those cute little pop-ups that come up on your computer, they're usually almost always things you would be interested in. And why is that? Because the crowd is monitoring your customs. What are you accustomed to watching? What are you accustomed to listening to? What are you accustomed to to clicking on? Those are your customs, okay? And they are being watched. And so that's how the enemy catches us in in a snare because we aren't watching what he's watching as we create customs for ourselves. So I believe that part of the reason why we're having such a hard time making wise decisions, it's because we refuse to let go of old customs. We refuse to let go of old customs. We have to be willing to let go of the old in order to receive the new that the Lord is trying to do in our lives. Let's move on to verse nine. It says, so he asked them, who is he? He, it's Pontius Pilate, who is them? Them, that's the crowd. Okay, so Pontius Pilate asked the crowd, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? (laughs) Okay, now how many of you find that interesting? You know, the one in authority is asking the crowd, those that are not in authority, what they wanted him to do. The one in authority is asking those who are not in authority what they want him to do. That's very interesting right there. So I, again, right there, let's just pause right there. I believe part of the reason why we're having such a hard time making wise decisions is because we're asking life and death questions to people who don't have the authority to make life or death decisions. Okay. I think we're going to get it by the time we get to the end of this. So, so why do, why do you think Pilate was so willing to ask the crowd for their input. What do you think? Type it in the chat. Come on, whether you're live or whether you're watching the recording, still, I want you to type it in the chat. Why do you think Pilate was so willing to ask the crowd for their input? And here's what I think. I think it was because he was afraid. Well, what was he afraid of? I believe he was afraid of what the crowd may say 
or what the crowd may do. You know, we can go 50 million different places with that, but I think at the base and the root of it, it was rooted in fear, okay? And so uh, Luke 12, verse five says this, the one you must fear is God, for he has both the power to take your life and the authority to cast your soul into hell. Yes, guess what? The only one you need to fear is God. And why is that so important here? It's because we will always have a hard time making wise decisions if we're more concerned about our status than we are about saving souls. Did you catch that? We will always have a hard time making wise decisions if we're more focused on preventing problems than prioritizing people. Okay, so Pilate, Pilate was more concerned about trying to prevent a problem. He was more concerned about trying to safeguard his status in the community. He, he was more concerned about uh, pleasing the people than he was about doing what it was that, that needed to be done in that particular situation. And so notice how Pilate worded his question. Did you notice? How did he word his question? He asked, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Listen, to me, that's significant. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Right there, Pilate is acknowledging Jesus as king of the Jews. Okay, we're going to put a pin right there because we're going to circle back around to that in a little while. So let's move on to verse 10. Verse 10 says, Pilate was fully aware that the religious leaders had handed Jesus over to him because of spite and envy. Whew, okay. All right, there's several things here. But the first thing, I just want to put this as just a little sidebar. I think it's interesting that the word, uh, the scripture here refers to the leaders as religious leaders, not spiritual leaders. Come on, religious leaders, not spiritual leaders. So notice uh, no, notice the difference. There's a difference between just being religious and being spiritually in tune. Okay, but I, I can't stay there because I got to get through this. But here's the point I really want to make from this verse. Uh, note that Pilate in this verse, it, it shows us Pilate was not a victim here. Okay, he wasn't a victim here. He was not deceived. The devil didn't make him do it. <laughs> Why? How do I know that? Because it says in the verse that he was fully aware. He was fully aware. Pilate was fully aware. And so how many of us, we do, we have a tendency to do that. We have a tendency to play the victim. Why do we do that? Why do we have it? Why do we choose to play the victim? Uh, You know, we we say things like this. Well, um, I didn't know. (laughs) Yes, you did. (laughs) Well, maybe I forgot. Well, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will bring back to your remembrance whatever it is the Lord has told you. Well, maybe he didn't tell me. Well, maybe that's because you haven't been in the word. (laughs) See, we find ways. We try to create ways to show ourselves as being the victim in so many different situations. But part of the reason, I believe, why we have such a hard time making wise decisions is because we rather play the victim then do what is necessary to walk in victory. Okay, let's keep going. Let's look at verse 11. But the ruling priests stirred up the crowd to incite them to ask for Barabbas instead. But the ruling priests stirred up the crowd to incite them to ask for Barabbas instead. Who stirred up the crowd? The ruling priest stirred up the crowd. I think it's interesting. The crowd didn't stir up the crowd. It was the ruling priest who stirred up the crowd. And why did the ruling priest stir up the crowd? To incite them. And what does incite mean? To incite is to instigate to instigate. So they did it on purpose. They were instigating. Okay. And so we need to be using, we need to use wisdom 
as we make decisions about who it is we're going to choose to follow. Because these were religious leaders <laughs> who were who was stirring up the crowd with the intention of inciting the crowd. Okay, I, I think it's, it's interesting, you know, when it comes to fo- who we choose to follow. I, I find it very interesting that we're really quick uh, to, to follow people, hundreds of people even, some of us maybe even thousands, we'll follow hundreds and thousands of people on social media without thinking twice about it. You know, click real quick, we'll click, we'll follow. You know, but, but when it comes to following Jesus, <laughs> When Jesus says, come follow me, we're hesitant. We're hesitant. One good post from somebody we don't know, and we choose to follow them. One request from the, from the one we call our Savior and our Lord, and we're hesitant to follow. We say things like, oh, okay, well, Jesus, um, where are we going? <laughs> what are we going to do? How long is this going to take? Who's going to pay for that? We have all kind of questions that we need. We feel like we, we have convinced ourselves we need to know every answer before we choose to follow him. But we, we don't ask any questions before we choose to follow someone else. So we, we have to use wisdom in who we choose to follow. And it's always, always a wise choice to follow Jesus when he asks us to. Okay? So, so what did they do? What did, when, the, when the ruling priest stirred up the crowd and incited them, what, what did they incite the crowd to do? They incited the crowd to ask for Barabbas instead. Okay? Ask for Barabbas instead. So because Pilate looked to the crowd for answers... He opened the door for the crowd to make their assertions. He opened the door wide. So now here they are asking for Barabbas instead. I believe part of the reason why we're having such a difficult time making wise decisions is because we're focused more on stirring the crowd instead of stirring the gifts. We're focused more on stirring the crowd than we are with stirring the gift. Second Timothy, first, Second Timothy chapter one, verses six and seven says this. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let me read that again. Therefore, I remind you to stir up what? The gift. Not any gift, the gift. Stir up the gift. What is the gift? The gift is the Holy Spirit. The gift is which is in you, is the Holy Spirit. And so, yes, I know that you're you're a gifted teacher. I know that you are a gifted to be an exhorter. I know you're gifted as a giver. I know that I know there's countless spiritual gifts, but the gift that is living on the inside of us is the Holy Spirit. And don't you find it interesting? I think a lot of times we quote these two verses independent of each other. But isn't it beautiful that they follow each other? It's telling us to stir up the gift that is living on the inside of us. And then what does verse 7 say? It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Okay, He's reminding us to stir up the gift that is on the inside of us. And then at right after that, telling us he has not given us a spirit of fear. What has he given us? He has given us the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us is not afraid of anything. 
Okay, so he's not giving us a spirit of fear, but of what? The Holy Spirit on the inside of us gives us power. Come on. Just a few weeks ago, we just went through a whole series on powerless. If you didn't see it or hear it, you need to go back because it's the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us that gives us the power. It not only gives us power, but he enables us to walk in love. We're in the middle of a crazy season. It's a lot going on all around us. We need the help of the Holy Spirit to enable us to walk in love no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, no matter what may be going on around us. The Holy Spirit who lives in us will help us to walk in love. Not only that, but also what? He'll help us to maintain a sound mind. Come on. We're talking about decisions, decisions, decisions. We're having to make a lot of tough decisions day by day, sometimes moment by moment. But the spirit of God who lives on the inside of us will help us to be able to make wise decisions in the midst of no matter what the circumstances are and enable us to do that and maintain a sound mind. That's good right there. We, we could technically stop right there, but I have a few more verses I want to get through, okay? So here's the bottom line of that. We do not have to be afraid of making tough decisions because the Spirit of God who lives inside of us is not afraid of anything. And that means he is not afraid of making tough decisions. All right, let's keep going. Let's look at verse 12. So Pilate asked them, what do you want me to do with this one you call the king of the Jews? (laughs) So Pilate asked them, Pilate asked the crowd again, Pilate asked the crowd, what do you want me to do with this one you call the king of the Jews? What do you want me to do? (laughs) What do you want me to do? He's asking the crowd. Here's what you need to know from this verse. The more questions you ask the crowd, the more your decisions are going to be influenced by the crowd. The more decisions you ask the crowd, the more your decisions are going to be influenced by the crowd. Okay, well, Kedra, how do you know that Pilate is being influenced by the crowd at this point? Because look at this. He he just acknowledged Jesus as king of the Jews three verses ago. And now here in verse 12, we see him starting to waver. How is it that he's starting to waver? Look how he referred to Jesus in this verse. He refers to Jesus. He says, the one you call (laughs) the king of the Jews. Okay, are you seeing it? It's so subtle. Those little two words make a difference. The one you call, you call the king of the Jews. So he went from calling Jesus the king of the Jews to now wavering and saying the one you call the king of the Jews. And I believe he's trying to give himself some wiggle room here so he won't feel guilty about the verdict that he's about to render. (laughs) Remember now, he, he's, he's fallen into this victim mentality. Okay, I'm not going to go back, but, but he's wavering now. The one you call the king of the Jews. So see, the more we seek direction from the crowd, the more we'll begin to question the truth we once declared. The more we seek direction from the crowd, the more we'll start to question the truth we ourselves once declared. Well, I wonder, is that really true? Is that really what the word says? Does that sound familiar? That's going all the way back to the garden. (laughs) That's exactly what the serpent did with Adam and Eve. Just, Just enough to cause them to question. So if we continue to allow ourselves to get input from the crowd... If we continue to question and present our questions to the crowd, we will continue to begin to to question the truth that we ourselves once declared. Okay, 
So, so let's go back to that verse because what was it that Pilate asked the crowd in this verse? He asked the crowd, what do you want me to do? Now that in and of itself is a great question. And actually, it's the right question. The only problem is he's asking the right question to the wrong people. (laughs) What do you want me to do is the question we should always ask of our Heavenly Father. What do you want me to do is always the right question. But when we ask it to God and not to the crowd. So I believe that one of the reasons why we have such a hard time making wise decisions is because we are consistently asking the right questions to the wrong people. Okay, let's keep going. We're almost done. Verse 13 says, and they all shouted back. What? Crucify him. They all shouted back, crucify him. Whew, that ought to get you right there. The crowd is shouting back at Pilate, crucify him. And they don't just stop there. Here's Pilate again asking the crowd another question. And what does he ask? Why? (laughs) Pilate asked, what evil thing has he done wrong to deserve that? He's asking this of the crowd. But what did the crowd do? They didn't answer Pilate's question. Do you notice that? Pilate asked him two questions. He asked him why (laughs) and what evil thing has he done wrong to deserve that? The crowd never responded to his question. They never answered his question. They just kept shouting out with a deafening roar, crucify him at once. Okay. Notice that Pilate here, Pilate is still asking questions. He's still asking questions to the crowd. But do you notice the shift here? The crowd is no longer asking questions. The crowd now is making demands. Okay. I believe part of the problem, part of the reason while we're struggling and having a hard time making wise decisions is because we're continuing to ask questions when we should be making declarations. Okay, so Pilate missed the shift here. We're asking questions like, am I going to make it through all of this? Like there's a lot going on. We're not in denial about what's going on in the earth right now. There is a lot going on, but we're asking questions of the crowd Questions like, am I going to make it through all this? Are we going to make it through all of this? Okay, now, again, instead of asking questions, that's not a question we should be asking. This is the point where we should be making declarations. What kind of declarations should we be making? We should be making declarations like, I am more than a conqueror. I've slain the lion and the bear. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? There's no weapon that's formed against me that's going to prosper. I am the head and not the tail. The beginning, the, I, I, all of those things that you know to declare, you should be declaring. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. I shall live and not die and declare the glorious word of the Lord. It's time to make declarations instead of asking questions to the crowd. It's imperative in this season that we believe the word that we have heard because we can't stand on a word that we really honestly don't believe. Okay. Here's something we need to notice. If you read the Bible, you'll remember the story that, that three times Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness. And three times, Jesus did not respond to Satan with a question. Jesus instead responded to Satan with a declaration. And every time, his response was, it is written. It is written. Jesus didn't ask Satan a question. (laughs) He didn't need Satan's input. He didn't want to open the door to Satan to provide his two cents. 
No, he made a declaration and he told Satan what was written. He made a declaration. He stood on what he believed. And we have to follow the example of Jesus. Okay? So when we can't, we can't be passive when we say we're going to stand on God's word. Why? Because just like in this verse, the crowd is going to keep on shouting. We can't be passive when we say we're going to stand on God's word because the crowd is going to keep on shouting. Notice the verse describes it as a deafening roar, <laughs> a deafening roar. What is deafening? What does that suggest? That, that means the only thing that Pilate could hear in that moment was what it was the crowd was shouting. Okay, it's, it's almost impossible for us to hear a still, small voice when we have the deafening roar of the crowd in our ear. Okay, so here it is. And at this point, as they're, as they're screaming, as they're shouting, as they're making their demands, they're no longer just screaming, crucify him. They're screaming, crucify him at once. Crucify him at once. So now they're applying pressure. They're applying pressure to Pilate. And so here we go. Part of the reason, <laughs> are you noticing a the theme here? Part of the reason that I, I believe that we're having such a tough time making wise decisions is because we're giving in to the pressure rather than allowing ourselves to be guided by peace. We're giving in to the pressure of the crowd rather than allowing ourselves to be guided by peace. Okay? We cannot allow the, fo the voice of the crowd to get louder than the voice of God. All right, here we go. Last verse. Verse 15. Because he wanted to please the people. <laughs> because he wanted, because Pilate wanted to please the people, he released Barabbas to them. After he had Jesus severely beaten with a whip made of leather straps and embedded with metal, he sentenced him to be crucified. You know where I'm stopping right here, right? <laughs> because he wanted to please the people. Let me ask you this. Who are the people in your crowd that you're trying to please? Let's not, let's not move too fast through that. I, I really want you to ask yourself that question and sit with it for a minute. Who are the people in your crowd that you're trying to please? Because here's something I want to point out about this crowd as it relates to Pilate. The people in Pilate's crowd were people that didn't even like him. <laughs> the people in Pilate's crowd were people who had their own interest in mind. The people in Pilate's crowd were people who only wanted to use him to get what they wanted. So again, I go back to the question that I want you to ask yourself, who are the people in your crowd that you are trying to please? So let's learn from Pilate's example. So because Pilate wanted to please the people, he released Barabbas, a murderer, and he restrained Jesus, a life giver. He released Barabbas, the world, and restrained Jesus, the word. Does that sound like anything to you? He released Barabbas, sin, <laughs> and he restrained Jesus, Savior. I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like binding and loosing to me. That sounds a lot like binding and loosing. And so here it is. I believe part of the reason 
why we are having such a hard time making wise decisions is because we're loosing what we should be binding and we're binding what we should be loosing. Come on. (laughs) We're allowing what we should not be allowing and we're not allowing what we should be allowing. (laughs) I am fresh out of time, so I can't go more deeply into binding and loosing. If you want to know more about it, you should enroll in life school. We teach about it there. Life school will make you better. Okay, here we go. So here we go. We, we, we're allowing the things that we should not be allowing and not allowing the things that we should be allowing. So often we do that. So often we do that and we don't even realize it. So, so how often do we do that? How often do we do exactly what it is that Pilate did? Okay, well, what is it that Pilate did? Pilate decided to keep his custom and crucify his king. (laughs) Pilate decided to keep his custom and crucify his king. How often do we do that? How often do we decide to keep our custom and crucify our king? All right. Pilate also did this. Pilate decided to listen to the crowd and ignore his conscience. How often do we do that? How often do we choose to listen to the crowd and ignore our conscience? And when I say conscience here, I'm talking about the whisper of the Holy Spirit. How often do we choose to listen to the shout of the crowd and ignore the whisper of the Holy Spirit? Three times Pilate asked the crowd what the crowd wanted him to do. And because of that, three times Pilate made poor decisions. Jeremiah 33 and verse 3 says this. Call to me and I will answer you. I'll tell you marvelous and wondrous things that you could never figure out on your own. There's so many things in this season that we do not know what decision to make, but we can rest on God's word. If nothing else, hold on to this, Jeremiah 33 and three. The Lord himself, the father in heaven says, call to me. He didn't say call to the crowd. Call to me and I will answer you. I will tell you marvelous and wondrous things that you could never figure out on your own. Stop trying to figure out things on your own. Call to your heavenly father and he will answer you. So if you want to make wise decisions, ask your questions to the creator instead of to the crowd. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are never changing. I thank you that we can trust you. We can depend on you and we can rely on you to be faithful to your word. Tonight, we choose to ask our questions to you instead of the crowd. Tonight, we ask you what it is you want us to do and we will obey In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you. Thanks for connecting with us today on the podcast. And you know, we'd love to connect with you in person at one of our campuses in Shreveport, Louisiana, or in Lake Charles, Louisiana. You can get all the information from our website, lifeunited.church.